Well, um, thank you very much indeed. I did have a title for my contribution. I don't know if it's come up or if it's going to come up, and it doesn't really matter if it doesn't. Um, but I'm not going to show PowerPoints or slides or anything in any case. Um, but the title that I suggested to the organisers was um, something along the lines of a team of Gareth Bales, um, why we don't need one. Um, now that might seem a little odd uh, concept to you because as you know uh, Gareth Bale is our most successful footballer in Wales. Um, I'm a massive football fan, former, former player myself, I played for Wales too but um, most of my work these days as well as being an academic is in sports governance so I'm uh, quite closely involved with the development of sport, football particularly but sport more generally um, across Wales and increasingly within the, the structures of UEFA which is as most of you know is a European governing body for football. Um, it's a little bit flippant the title but there is a point to it really which is to say that um, as well as trying to show that you know teamwork is everything in sport um, last year most of you know Wales had a tremendously successful uh, tournament in the Euros thanks to Chris Coleman um, as he's now departed he gave us the, probably the best summer of our lives I think in sporting terms but the point I was trying to make really was that success generally comes from and within teams and teams are not comprised of identical individuals um, however skillful they are you know my point about Gareth Bale really um, teams are about balance and difference they're about diverse skills experience different positions you know you can't play 11 goalkeepers any more than you can play 11 wingers or 11 forwards in in sport um, and the whole point is when you blend a team um, the objective is to make sure that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts and that's where the diversity bit comes in. Uh, now, a couple of uh, qualifications. Um, I'm not a scientist. Um, uh, Karen was nervous about speaking in an area that was tangential to her field, but, but I'm completely outside it because I'm not a scientist. Well, I'm a political scientist, but I guess that's not quite the same thing. Uh, my work is about Welsh politics and devolution. It's where, where I um, uh, research. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm an academic now who probably for the last 10 years has always had one foot outside the university environment. Sometimes it's felt like both feet, really, but um, all credit to Cardiff. You know, I, I joined the university uh, just over a year ago now, where I was previously at Liverpool University. Um, and I joined with a very clear um, expectation from myself and from the uh, senior management team that my role would be all about impact and engagement. Uh, in, in, this, in the stream that Mark talked about a moment ago, um, but quite different in the sense that the stakeholders that I work with tend to be politicians, government and uh, parliamentary legislatures and so on. Um, so that's my first qualification. Um, my second point really, less of a qualification, more of a point is that um, I'm not going to talk specifically about how you improve diversity in, in STEM. I'm going to talk more about um, issues that face um, groups that are not as well represented as others in all decision-making positions currently. And secondly, I'm going to talk a bit about leadership in the same vein as Karen did, really, because unless you have leadership around an agenda like diversity and equality, the truth is that things just don't um, happen. Um, and it's, it's a very interesting time, isn't it, at the moment, to be talking about um, these things because we're in a pretty febrile environment. You know, we've had the sexual harassment uh, accusations, bullying, discrimination across a whole range of sectors. You know, we don't need to rehearse them. It's a pretty grubby environment at the moment. You know, politics, Hollywood, acting, arts, culture, sport, all of them really have dimensions to uh, them which are, make for pretty unsavoury um, reading and of course beneath all of that is a concept called power um, th you know the reason that these things have lain dormant for so long and the reason why they're now being rehearsed is because power is held by very few people um, it's concentrated in the hands of uh, very small groups of people in every organization um, and those groups tend to be completely lacking in diversity with a lack of diversity comes a lack of challenge it's been alluded to already. Um, the best organisations are diverse, not because they look better, um, but because they perform better. And the reason they perform better is because they have creative tension, challenge, um, uh, constant development that goes on by the interface between the, the people who uh, belong uh, in them. So we've got power. Um, further down the line, um, we've probably got something along the lines of privilege. Um, the reason that most people get to powerful positions is because they've been privileged at some point in their lives. I'll come on to that later because I'm going to debunk the whole notion of meritocracy. Um, you know, I'm very, very weary of being told that um, 
what we have at the moment is a meritocracy. All the data and all the evidence suggests otherwise. So, you know, let's kind of try and unravel that concept a little bit. Um, so privilege is always inherent in it. But actually, as well as privilege, there's also this concept of confidence and self-belief. And there, I think, lies a really significant issue f for women, for people from black and minority ethnic groups, for younger people, um, for anybody, really, who doesn't look like an archetypal leader. Um, and it's the problem we have. Because we don't have enough people already who look different, who sound different, who feel different, then there is um, a lack of confidence naturally amongst the next generation who we are trying to coax into positions of authority and so on. Now, of course, I'm not suggesting for a moment that the reason we don't have diversity in uh, most positions of, of power is purely to do with behaviours. Um, of course it's not. Um, and Karen was right to call out the kind of leaky pipeline issue and the glass ceiling and the cliff edge and all of these things, really, because it does put the onus on the people who are currently um, not at the top of the professions rather than the people who are at the top of the professions. Um, and I think that's misleading. Um, so, th so it's not just about behaviours. A lot of it is systemic and historic. But, but I feel quite positive that um, at the moment, because we have this kind of perfect storm of visibility of concentration of power, bad behaviour by people who are in power, that we may just have the kind of perfect storm for doing something about it with the right kind of commitment from a range of people. Because the reality is that confident people don't squirrel away power and accumulate it for their own sake. Really good leaders, really good people who have power, actually share it, they give power away, they delegate, they recruit people who are different to them, um, and all of those things. So all of the good leaders that I've uh, learned from, and I continue to learn from, have been people who uh, don't tuck their power away and um, allow it to be um, distributed a little bit more equally amongst the people that uh, they work with. You all know the figures about concentrations of power. I'm not going to bore you with them. But let me just tell you two from my world, because this is a world I work in on a daily basis. I, I won't even touch sport, because that's another question. Not good, by the way, but I won't, I won't go there for the moment. Just in the world of politics, 80% of all politically political power positions globally are held by men. 80%. And that's actually an improvement, because it was about 86% a decade ago. And that means that had Hillary Clinton won the US presidential election um, a year ago now, she would have become only the 18th global prime minister or president who is female, 18 out of all the countries in the whole world. And again, that is a massive improvement on what it looked like for, for gender even five or six years ago. Um, so, you know, we, we know the position about women in academia. We know that um, there is uh, plenty of women at uh, lower grades, let's say, and plenty of women who are at lecturer level and at research level, but much, much more difficult to get good representation of women at a professorial level, or indeed senior uh, professional services role. Um, now, I think um, these realities for women in leadership and in politics and in academia, and I know in STEM, even though I'm not closely involved in it myself, um, frustrate us, I think, as, as individuals, but they don't just fr frustrate women. Um, lots of good men, and I mean, I mean that in the sense of, of men who understand that this is not just unfair, but isn't advantageous to their worlds and to the probing, in, in, inquisitive nature of good research. They feel strongly about this as well. And at the end of the day, you know, men, men are fathers and are partners and are husbands and are um, sons. So, you know, in, it's a strange man, isn't it, who can't see that this it doesn't work for anybody. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot of strange men still in senior positions of power. But, but you know, in my experience, most younger men particularly, and most, most men who are thoughtful and inquisitive, can see this doesn't really work for anybody. Um, and I think the same would apply to race and ethnicity and cultural differences as well, in all honesty, amongst, um, amongst most of us. Um, OK, so wh where do we go with it, really? Well, let me say a little bit about my... Um, my career journey, um, not to bore you with details because um, in, in some respects it's pretty unremarkable, but because I've learnt a lot about the stages which have allowed me to take on leadership roles. I mentioned that I've got one foot outside academia. Um, that some of those roles have been in sport. I was chair of Sport Wales um, here, which I don't know if any of you know, but is the um, agency, the government agency that looks after all of sport from children's first experiences to our elite athletes. 
um, you know, that was a three day a week uh, public appointment. So my, my career was split between doing that and uh, my academic work. Um, and mo most recently, uh, aside from sport, I'm still on the Football Association of Wales board and I'm on UEFA uh, as Women's Football Committee. But aside from that, most of my work has been on trying to make a difference within politics. But, but not as a politician. So that's a weird kind of balance to strike, really, because you know I'm commenting and uh, researching and analysing and trying to change whilst not being a politician. And that can be a very uneasy relationship at times. Uh, my big project at the moment, which we'll report in the next few weeks, so look out for this, because it won't be received well, I can tell you now, um, is a project that I'm doing for the uh, presiding officer at the National Assembly, looking at how we engineer a more fit-for-purpose assembly. And I can tell you now that will mean more politicians. So you can see what I'm saying here in terms of how it will be received. Um, nobody wants more politicians, um, but equally nobody wants poor governance and poor scrutiny, and you simply cannot have the two things uh, uh, as it stands. So we're reporting on um, the size of the Assembly, a new electoral system to elect a bigger Assembly, and perhaps relevant for those of you with teenage children or people who care about the youth vote, um, votes at 16 and 17. So these areas are now devolved to Wales, by the way, so for the first time we can make a decision on any of these. We could be the first um, nation to introduce a different electoral system. Um, we, or we could follow Scotland in introducing uh, votes at 16, but all of that we'll report to, uh, on. And so things like that have taken up a big uh, chunk of my time. And, and I think the reason for that is that uh, I come from a fairly ordinary family, but with quite extraordinary women within it. And that's been a big motivation for me. Um, I grew up just down the road in Bridgend, my family are from my Steg. Um, my mother was the daughter of a, a, a minor, not just a minor, but an NUM official. Um, some of my earliest memories, you know, were going to political meetings with my grandfather because he chaired one of the uh, NUM lodges in, in my Steg. And although I was too young to really know what was going on, I can remember the kind of passion and anger in the room about issues like conditions and fairness and wages and so on. And, I, you know, most of it maybe permeated a little bit into my brain. Um, without really knowing what was going on. And my mum was very much a product of, of that environment in that she, she left school very early, um, uh, didn't uh, have much in the way of qualifications, um, and got married very young, had three children, relatively young as well, but then went back out into the labour market and trained herself and became a social worker. Um, but from her kind of background, you know, going into those sort of professional jobs was very unusual. Um, but she was in many ways a sort of epitome of the aspirational working class. Um, she felt we were just as, as good as anybody else, um, that we shouldn't be intimidated by anything. And secondly, and this is very, very important, you know, because I believe very strongly in this, that you should push yourself to the limit. Um, now, that sounds very macho in some regards. You've got to be careful how you present this. But my take on all of this is you only have one life. Um, you only have one go at your career, really. I mean, you can reinvent yourself in lots of different careers, but you, there's a finite period, isn't there, for which you will be working and which you will be engaging and which you will be really interested and motivated. Um, and for me, that means putting as much into it as you possibly can whilst being um, conscious for the, all of us with families that the balance between what you do and what you do at home is really very, very important and uh, very, very significant. But, but my, my family kind of drove us to try and achieve, and try and achieve in a practical way as well. You know, there was this sense that if you did something, if you had talent or ability, you should try and do something for the rest of your community as well. You know, so all the great things that you, you guys are doing in science hopefully has a dramatic impact on the people around us. And whilst I don't claim for a moment that politics is as meaningful as medicine or um, engineering in that sense, um, it can be at times because you know the decisions that our leaders make in that political environment are pretty crucial to everything you do in the university sector and in industry um, and so on. And we, we had kind of mantras that I that I later went on to realise were sporting ones as well, like um, marginal gains, being comfortable with the uncomfortable comfortable um, and realistic ambitions, you know, all of these things that whilst we didn't articulate them in those terms were ideas that as a family, you know, certainly and as a, 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 as a young person I'd really embraced. Um, and I had my education in a very, very ordinary comprehensive, but a very good comprehensive in fact in Bridgend. Um, and then I went to uh, London School of Economics to, to study for a degree in politics. Um, and I shouldn't really confess 
to this, but I do often because I judged where, which universities to apply to purely on the basis of where Cardiff City were playing mostly and where I could see most away games. So London at the time, Cardiff were in the third division actually, and London gave me more opportunities to see Cardiff play away than virtually anywhere else. So all my choices on my um, application form were London universities. But but actually I went I went to LSE and um, it was a real awakening for a whole host of, of reasons. Um, first of all, because uh, in my cohort of students doing government, politics essentially, um, there were only three of us who hadn't been to private schools. I mean, LSE is, you know, Oxbridge light in lots of regards. Um, three of us who hadn't been to private schools. And initially I was terrified of, of the other students. You know, they all spoke with very, very posh accents. The first time I realised I had a Welsh accent, actually, because, of course, if you, don't, if you haven't been outside Wales to live, how do you know you've got a Welsh accent, really, until people are playing it back to you, you know, and, and teasing you about the way you uh, use expressions and so on. Uh, so I learned that, but I also had a few other new experiences which have stuck with me. Um, bear in mind now I come from Bridgend. This was the first time I'd ever met a Tory. Uh, literally, I, they, in, in our areas, you know, they shipped in Conservative candidates to stand in elections from, from England. You know, there wasn't a Conservative party really in the Valleys and, and Bridgend. It's different now, of course. But genuinely, I'd never met a Conservative and I'd never had a debate with a Conservative. Um, and so I sharpened my mind, you know, I listened to these um, centre-right ideas. Um, it made me think differently about politics. didn't necessarily persuade me, but it made me think differently about politics. And that is crucial, challenging your own self and your prejudices and your views and uh, embracing the kind of learning experience. So that was fantastic. But most importantly of all, I think, in terms of lasting lessons for me, was that um, I realised that all of these sort of super superficially super confident people um, were actually quite fragile. Um, they'd had much more limited life experiences than I had, um, having grown up in the rough and tumble of a comprehensive and uh, a town like Bridgend, where if you hadn't had a drink by the time you were 14, there was something wrong with you, quite <laughs> frankly. Um, th these kids just hadn't had the same life experiences as I had. Um, they'd had a lot of privilege, um, and they had a sense of entitlement that came from that privilege but they didn't really have the same belief and confidence that I had as an ordinary kid from, from Bridgend. And I think as I saw that, I became more confident in myself. And it's, it's something that I think both of the speakers who have come before me have mentioned really, that we need to put people who are not well represented in positions in situations where they meet their peers, and they may be from completely different uh, backgrounds to them, and they will see that they have every much a right to be in those environments as anyone else. Um, because I think you gain confidence from measuring yourself against other people. Classic case in sport, isn't it? Um, sport is one of those really classic old-fashioned meritocracies, but it isn't, of course, because the, you know, the, the, there's never a level playing field in terms of getting into sport. But if you're lining up in the 100 metres final in an Olympic race, it's very simple, isn't it? It's who's fastest to the line. Um, and, and, you know, in many respects, it doesn't matter about your background then or what you are, who you are, what you're doing. You know, it's purely a, a, an issue of your skills and your abilities. Um, we were talking outside with, with some colleagues about role models. Um, and I'd make a plea to all of you here as well. Um, if you're a woman or you're a person who isn't white or if you're um, from an LGBT background or if you're younger than most people in your profession, um, let me tell you, you are a role model, whether you like it or not, um, so embrace it. Um, you, you can be a role model, of course, if you're not from one, one of those uh, identities as well, but I can tell you now, though, if you are, there'll be somebody who's looking at you and thinking, oh, she did it, or he did it, um, and so I want to do it. And what, what I'm recommending to you is to embrace it in a positive way, because from my experience, you don't need to be perfect to be a role model. Um, the best role models actually are people who are flawed, um, the warts and all versions, because they're real. I mean, perfection is terrifying, isn't it? You know, if you see the perfect person, I mean, I remember doing this in sport. I did a, a session with a group of teenage girls and I put up pictures of some of the great uh, females in sport and then a couple of kind of local people who were doing Zumba or something. And of course, all the girls related far more to the uh, young girl who was slightly overweight, who had baggy tracks at bottoms on than they t did to Jess Ennis with a six pack because that's you know unreachable isn't it in their minds you know and it, it's and I'm not being critical here you know I'm just talking about realities you will you will be displaying qualities and 
aspects of yourself which people can relate to if you're a role model. So that area of kind of reaching down below you as well as reaching up in terms of your own career simultaneously, I think is um, very, very important indeed. Let me go back to that um, meritocracy uh, point that I made earlier, um, because this will feature in my report on um, electoral reform for the Assembly. Um, it won't be in quite these terms, I hesitate to, to say, because I will have phrased it, of course, much more diplomatically than I'm going to phrase it now. Um, but I get very frustrated when people talk about meritocracies, and they usually talk about them in the context of positive action or positive intervention or quotas, God forbid, because we're not allowed to talk about these, but we will be talking about them in my report. Um, and I find that extremely frustrating because much of the conversation about positive action, you know, should we do something that is specifically designed for women, for black people, for gay people, for disabled people? Um, should we uh, be creating the conditions to promote those groups in underrepresented sectors? Um, the problem I have with it is that most of the arguments against positive action are infantile. And if they're not infantile, they're unintellectual. And let me explain why. Um, meritocracies, no, take a step back, positive action. Lots of people say, oh, I'm all for equality, but I don't like positive action. I'd rather get there on my own merit, because if there's a meritocracy, I will get there. Well, look, come on, wake up and smell the coffee here. You know, uh, positive action has worked very, very well for white men over the generations. Um, it has been <coughs> deliberately instilled in creating the next generation of, of leaders. That's positive action. Not all of it is unconscious, by the way. I think unconscious bias is a very significant factor and, and so training is good but there's very conscious bias going on as well and and you know it, we, we we have to address those things we have visions of what politicians look like i'll come back to that in a second and we have visions of what powerful people look like um if meritocracy was based on neutral unbiased values then fine but it's not it's gender loaded it's racially loaded in terms of how it's uh, measured um, and it, it's biased in favour of the group of people who are already in authority. And if you want to just test that a little bit, think about just how the sexes are referred to um, in the language of professional life. Okay, now loads has been written on this, and I, you know, so it's not my, this isn't me suggesting some great interesting thing, but it, it's fascinating in many regards. Think about these adjectives, assertive, bossy. Do you ever hear a boy or a man being called bossy? always applied to assertive women, okay? Forceful, feisty. Do you hear men being called feisty? Not often, believe me. Gregarious, different implications for women, of course. A gregarious man goes out and socializes with his um, colleagues in a positive way. A gregarious woman, there's always an undercurrent of what's she after, what's she doing, and so on and so forth. Ambitious. Is ambitious a positive when it's applied to women? Not always, believe me. It can be as it can be a derogatory term as much as it can a positive term. And then just things about uh, women's appearance and voices. Shrill. That's been applied to a whole range of women politicians, by the way, but never to a male politician, which is which is quite interesting. So we've got those kind of unconscious biases, um, our own lives and experiences, because they're invariably the prisms, aren't they, through which we see things. But we've also got. Um, some built-in biases that we cover up and conceal with this concept of a meritocracy. So personally, I don't have a problem with positive action. I think we should, we should address it. And where appropriate, we should address it head on. Um, if somebody presents me with a valid argument against it, then I would listen to it, but I haven't heard it yet. The only one that people keep putting forward is that slower, incremental, less controversial interventions, i.e. not positive action, will allow us to take people with us on the equality journey. Well, you know, come on, we've been having some interventions now for the best part of 30 years, and look at where we are. Um, I've got a four-year-old daughter, who, by the way, fascinatingly, loves dolls, and loves has gone through the pink phase and so on, but she also loves football, she loves taekwondo, she loves boxing, and, and that's really what we're trying to do for all our children, isn't it? You know, expose them to all of the things that they potentially can do, whether it's science, arts, literature, culture, sport, and so on. Um, uh, Annie, my daughter, had her first um, PE lesson, just started part-time school this term, 
Um, and I asked her what she did in PE, and in that true spirit that all children do, she said nothing. And then when, when I said, what did you really do? She said, well, we walked like a crab, and then I taught Ivan and Kayo how to kick a football. And I thought, well, obviously, she could tell she'd been brought up in, in our household. But, you know, these are the kind of confidences that we, you know, we hope that a young generation of children will, will, um, will enshrine. And the point I'm making really is that we, we, if we don't believe in doing things about equality, then we're essentially sacrificing a generation of girls and probably a generation below them whilst we take people with us. Well, I'm sorry, people have got to speed up in coming with us. Um, you know, we can't sacrifice people along the way here. And actually, you know, this nonsense about consensus as well, um, it's back to my point about an intellectual case against a meritocracy. I'm com confident enough in our intellectual case for positive action that I think we should try, try and build consensus around that rather than wait to build consensus around an alternative one. Now, just to finish off, let me say a few things about leadership. Karen mentioned some really good points there, and Mark did as well in terms of the, the practical projects that um, he's been involved in. I just want to say something uh, which is by, by way of warning, I think, from my own experiences, because when you embark on your leadership journey, um, there's a real sense uh, that you need to learn about leadership. Um, and there's real danger that you kind of take some of those dreadful, awful textbooks about learning to be a leader. Um, you know, you see them in WH Smiths, don't you, in the train stations. Um, don't ever go down that route, please, you know, because sometimes you can just spot somebody who's digested a book like that a mile off. Unfortunately, they are often in leadership positions, which is more worrying. Um, but don't, don't, you know, don't use those kind of things. They just really are of no use whatsoever. Um, and, and take a really diverse range of people to learn from. Um, you know, there isn't a kind of leadership uniform that you can put on, you know, for, for all the reasons Karen, Karen mentioned, you know, leadership occurs at all levels, you have to bring your own personality and your, your own style into it. There isn't just one style of leadership or one type of leader. And in fact, those of us who are in leadership positions, it should be incumbent on us to encourage different types of leadership behaviours, you know, formal, informal, dressing down rather than always dressing in a way that looks intimidating to other people and so on and so forth. Um, there isn't a prototype leadership style, so don't try and look for it, you know. Try and develop what you have inside. Um, don't shoehorn yourself into one of your role models images, because, you, you know, we all have people that have been really helpful to us and have helped develop us and so on. And there's a real tendency then, isn't it, to ape what they do, to imitate them. But the reality is, what works for somebody else won't necessarily work for you. So I guess the, the uh, uh, point I'm making is, borrow from other people, styles, behaviours, um, rhetoric, whatever it is, but adapt it to what you are all about. Because if you just wear the cloak of somebody else, you know, you're going to look a little bit of an imposter and feel like an imposter rather than feel like somebody um, who is uh, actually comfortable in leadership roles. The reason I'm mentioning this is that diverse leadership is absolutely crucial for good organisational delivery. Um, it's, the, it's the kind of devolutionary, uh, it's a devolutionary, I'm obsessed with devolution, the di diversity dividend that I mentioned earlier on. Um, one leadership author described um, anything other than finding your own way in the leadership route as being simply collecting a wider range of blind spots and institutional blindness. Um, right in many regards you know because if you're trying to create a uniform leadership cadre all you'll do is miss the blind spots you're already missing and a few more actually because people will come from similar backgrounds um, and so on and then i think it's about developing resilience you know and i think you've got to be careful here about how you communicate this to um uh, to people who are not in positions of uh, not in positions of authority uh, it's not about macho stuff you know it's about becoming um, more self-critical, um, learning from your mistakes. I mean, I agree with Karen, you know, for me personally, I, I, I always find I learn better from, um, uh, better from failure than I do from, uh, uh, from success. Um, have a read of a book called The Div Diversity Bonus by Scott Page, if you haven't already, from uh, Michigan University. Different take, because he doesn't talk about representational diversity, talks about cognitive diversity and creative tension in organisations and so on. Um, so just, just to finish, really, I guess, um, you know, the advice that I've got in terms of diverse leadership generally is um, take on all the challenges you have. 
use the fact that you might be different, you might be younger, you might be female, you might be from a, a black and minority ethnic background, whatever, use all of the things that make you stand out to your advantage as well. Um, it's not all negative. Um, you get asked to do uh, lots more things in the leadership role. I don't know if Karen uh, um, agrees with me. You get asked to do lots more things when you are in a leadership role as a woman than you would as a male leader, without a shadow of a doubt. And just take some gambles. You know, we, we're all a little bit cautious, we're all a little bit risk averse, and, and women generally tend to be more because there's more at stake, you know, as you said about your career decision with, you know, going away or staying locally and, and so on. You know, we've got to take risks. We, we've just simply got to do that, but, but do them in a sensible way and use the skills that you have. But most of all, be confident because, you know, from my experience, the women uh, I've worked with, the younger leaders, um, the people who, are not, who don't look like the, the mainstream leaders have tended to be better. So it kind of proves the point, doesn't it? That diverse groups, um, not the team of Gareth Bales, tend to deliver better results and more successful organisations.